Thank you very much. All right, good evening. I'm uh, going to talk to you a little bit about opportunities in science. And I'm really happy to have the opportunity here to, my opportunity to share uh, what we do with you guys. And hopefully I can reach one or two of you, maybe three or four would be great, to get excited about trying to do research in science. And first of all, um, why is this important? Well, uh, in the United States, there are not enough uh, qualified scientists and engineers. This may seem like a really crazy thing to say with the unemployment issues that we hear about all the time, but it is true. There's just not enough people who have uh, science degrees and engineering degrees to meet the need in the workforce. Um, and that is, uh, to, that is partially due, I think, to uh, a lot of uh, kid, young kids, uh, high school, sometimes even middle school, who get kind of veered away from science. Science isn't cool, science is boring, and science is kind of not really what you want to do. You want to make a lot of money and be a lawyer or, or you know, something else. So really, uh, when the time comes for the students to, to really have the chance to maybe try a shot at science, it's already too late. And uh, they don't get to see uh, what a professional scientist's life is really all about. Uh, there's a way to change this, and that is science research. That is really my belief that by doing science research, uh, you can kind of see what all the boring science classes are really intended for in the first place. So, how does one go about doing that? Well, you know, doing research is not necessarily an obvious thing. Where do I go for this? Uh, how do I get into a research program somewhere? This is a problem that actually goes all the way through to many undergraduates. Uh, when they leave their four-year degree school, uh, a lot of them don't have the chance to do research. And that's really uh, something that kind of happened to me. Uh, I was long ago uh, a uh, keen little undergraduate uh, studying chemistry in a very good school. And um, I was looking forward to having something blow my mind. You know, I'm going to be here, I'm going to learn a lot. We'll do a lot of stuff I don't really want to do, but there's going to be something there that makes it all worthwhile. And that wasn't the case. I became very disgruntled. I thought, what am I doing here? I'm going to switch careers to something completely different. Until at the very end of my degree, I got a chance to do some research. And everything changed for me. Uh, I suddenly realized why I had to learn all the things that I learned. I finally realized uh, that they actually had purpose. Uh, I realized that you can build on those things and do something really cool, which is science research. And Thing that was really uh, extremely uh, uplifting and empowering to me when uh, I did my, had my first shot at research was to see how different working in the lab when you're doing a research project is from doing just a lab class where you know the answer, where there's a wrong answer, where if you don't get enough of a particular material that you're trying to make, you don't get as good a grade. There is this looming thing about the grade. And with the research, there's none of that. There is no right answer. Nobody really knows the answer if you're really doing research. And uh, there is no grade. It's all about transcending all these sort of things that we're used to uh, throughout all our scholastic upbringing up until that point. And suddenly you realize there's this open new area, this unexplored area. You really are just like the explorers of all. You're going into an area that nobody's ever been to before. Nobody on the planet knows the answer to what you're trying to do. And that's a phenomenal thing. You ask these questions, you get answers, you try and figure out what's going on, and hopefully it'll bring you to something interesting. So really, um, getting this experience uh, is very difficult for a lot of people. And so you really do need a new paradigm to be able to step into a research experience, hopefully as early on as high school. And that's where we come in. Uh, many years ago, uh, I started the Oprah Institute of Science, where really uh, we have a sort of dual purpose. Number one, we do high quality science research. If you don't do pure science research, you're wasting your time trying to get people excited in science research. You, you can't pretend you really have to do it. And then you've got to give this opportunity to people who don't have the opportunity and blend that with those who do so that you have a nice, dynamic, diverse uh, environment in your lab. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I have brief enough uh, as it is. But basically, these are kind of some of the uh, key points about how we're set up. We're very small. Uh, we, uh, we run like an academic uh, group at a university that's kind of spun off onto a separate campus. And we give opportunities to, like I said, high school and above. And, uh, and uh, everybody works together in an open space. We were specifically set up to do uh, cutting edge science research and to fulfill the mission I just talked to you about and to reach uh, as diverse a talent pool as possible. 
uh, both from an, um, a socioeconomic perspective, cultural perspective, ethnic perspective, and also educational perspective, the level of education. So our, our focus really is environmental and biomedical research. And uh, Diana asked me to, to share with you a couple of journeys, a couple of discoveries that uh, will be way out there and uh, exciting for you guys. I don't know if I can deliver on that, but I'll, I'll do my best. I chose three that I thought might be of interest to you guys, so three projects that we are in the middle of doing or have done. The first one uh, of two programs that are in microbial ecology, uh, this is environmental microbial ecology, where we're looking for so-called extremophiles. These are uh, microorganisms, both bacteria and archaea, that can uh, live and thrive in extreme or very challenging environments. And this is a, a site up uh, in Ventura County, Santa Paula, where you have these, these tar pits. You have uh, these essential craters where tar is just bubbling with, I don't know what you want to call it, life, but it's bubbling with something. The gas is produced somewhere inside this pit of horrible, sticky, messy black stuff. And we went there and we collected uh, a whole bunch of uh, samples and uh, tried to figure out uh, if there are some organisms that actually active in the tar and what are they doing in there and uh, what can we learn from them. You know, can we maybe isolate a new enzyme to degrade uh, oil spills? Uh, so uh, in that search, we found something very interesting. We managed to isolate some organisms. We grew them in culture as pure organisms and suddenly, uh, when you, when you, draw, when you uh, grow a microbial culture in a tube, it gets turbid. As the organisms grow, the more cells are there, the more turbid the solution gets. And suddenly, after a few days, it went from being turbid to being clear. And uh, at the bottom of the tube, you can see here this uh, sort of woolly uh, stuff, uh, we had this floating uh, lumps, blocks of material. And uh, at first, we didn't really know what that was, but uh, when we looked at it some more, we realized that these were actual, uh, what's called bacterial biofilms. You might have heard of them. If you scratch in front of your teeth, especially now that you're all hungry, you probably feel a slimy stuff in the front. That's the bacterial biofilm. Uh, they're everywhere. Um, they're in your drain. You know, when you have that slime in your sink, yeah, well, that's a biofilm too. <laughs> so biofilms are actually very interesting. And uh, when we looked at the uh, bacterial biofilms that uh, were growing in those tubes, we found some very interesting um, architectures. And I, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about them very much, but here's the sort of flocculent stuff that you saw. But there's this sort of parachute-like uh, appendage with a, with a sort of a bar coming out of it. You can see it here more clearly, sort of like a tail. And uh, we, we were fascinated when we saw these structures in the microscope, was what could they mean? You know, why did the bacteria make them? There has to be a reason. And when we looked at them with uh, what's called scanning electron microscopy, where you can look at very high magnifications, uh, you can see that there are all these very beautiful structures. The ones that really caught my eye were these ones here, these sort of honeycomb-like structures that are ordered and um, look a little bit like uh, a sort of bee honeycomb or a sponge, uh, but those are multicellular organisms. Bacteria aren't supposed to be able to do that. So that's a, a really cool thing where these wires here, these nanowires as they're called, actually conduct electricity. People think that uh, this is like a bacterial brain, if you want, with the bacteria actually individual neurons within the structure. They send electrons back and forth to each other. Very, very interesting, and, and we still don't know very much about this. We did some work where we went to look at um, labeling uh, these structures for fluorescence microscopy. We wanted to see whether the bacteria are live bacteria, what they're doing, and uh, this picture started to emerge where we saw that the structures actually uh, were very heterogeneous chemically. And there were some that had a lot of bacteria living in them, and there were others with a lot of dead bacteria. And it seemed to be like a wave with the bacteria moving through. And what was really cool is that one day we figured out that uh, we did some what's called EDS study. This is uh, a technique that allows you to look at the elemental composition at this very high resolution. And all the blue, sort of purpley, lavender colored stuff is uh, calcium. So what's, what it turns out is that we're actually mineralizing uh, our media and growing uh, calcium uh, structures inside the biofilm, and that's what's holding the whole thing together. And the bacteria are doing all this, I can't say on purpose because they don't really have brains, but there is some function there that we don't understand. One thing I've got to tell you, bacteria are the most fascinating organisms there are. They, they're they extremely stingy when it comes to energy. They don't do anything without it giving them something back. So. Um, they would be spending all this energy uh, making these structures if it didn't serve a purpose. So uh, at the very end, uh, this is ongoing actually in my lab right now, we, uh, did, we isolated uh, bacterial DNA 
from the samples uh, and, uh, and sequenced it with this really excellent new state-of-the-art technology where we're able to look at all the organisms within the sample and classify them. And uh, we looked at soil samples, water samples, the tar, asphalt, and then we actually tried to culture some of the organisms as well. And this is what's called a beta diversity plot. It basically shows you the closer these, these spheres are to each other, the more related they are in terms of the overall community structure. And as you can see, the water samples and asphalt, this is water that's oozing out of the asphalt, uh, are, are quite related as you'd expect, but the cultures are very different and the soil samples are completely different. These are soil taken right next to it. So this tells us a little bit about who's there and, and kind of where they come from. And again, we don't really have time to talk much about this, but I just wanted to show you some of these images. This is alpha diversity. This shows you the different types of bacterial taxa and archaeal taxa that are in the samples of you know, different families of organisms. You can see that the, the water samples, so, uh, soil and asphalt samples, are very diverse. There's a lot of different colors here, a lot of different groups. Uh, the asphalt and the water look similar, as we saw in the beta diversity plot. The soil is quite different, but very diverse. And the culture has very little diversity. And that is something we, we know because uh, you can't, it's a hard thing to actually culture uh, bacteria. Only about 1 to 10 percent of bacteria in a sample can actually be cultured. So it's, it's much better to look at these things with these molecular techniques. All right, so moving on. Um, having, having done this work, you may not be surprised, maybe you will, that we started working on something compl completely different. The Human Microbiome Project is something you've probably heard about. Actually, in the news right now, there's been a lot of talk on this uh, about bacteria in the gut and uh, all the functions they have from uh, preventing heart attacks or causing heart attacks to even participating in autism. So bacteria in the body are very important. And why is that? Well, for every cell of your own cells in your body, we actually have 10 bacterial cells in our bodies. So there's 10 times as many bacteria in our bodies as there is our cells. And those bacteria have an enormous genetic potential. They actually have express and, and have 150 times more different types of genes than we do. So really, who's the boss here? Is it the bacteria or is it us? Uh, most of those bacteria, over 99% of them, are actually beneficial. We can't live without them. If you were to sterilize your body of the bacteria in it, you wouldn't live past the day. You need them to digest our food. We need them for many, many, many different purposes. And this is now a big project that's being studied by the National Institutes of Health. We're looking to see uh, how these different uh, uh, organisms in the body, the microbiome, uh, what they do, how they participate in disease, how they protect from disease. And there are a number of different microbiomes, that, as I can uh, list here. The one that's particularly interesting for us is uh, the vaginal microbiome. And there's a reason for that. We are actually working on technology to prevent women from contracting HIV. And it's a vaginal ring uh, designed for the developing world, mostly sub-Saharan Africa, where women who have very little power uh, because of the uh, socio-cultural uh, arrangements that, are, that exist there, uh, they can protect themselves uh, during, from sexually contracting HIV by wearing uh, vaginal rings that release antiretroviral drugs and therefore prevent the virus from essentially establishing itself even though they may become exposed to it. And in the process of that work, we, um, we were interested to see, given our microbiology background, um, is it possible for bacteria to colonize the rings and form biofilms of the rings, like the ones I showed you for the environmental isolates? It is certainly possible. Uh, nobody has ever looked at this, strangely enough. So we set up and, and did this. We did a study uh, with the CDC where we tested our intravaginal rings in pigtail macaques. It's a small, small monkey. And uh, they are models for humans because their vaginal microbiome is very similar to us. This is a non-deadly uh, study. The monkeys happily survive afterwards. Um, they wear pants because otherwise they take out the rings. Uh, so there's a lot of little things that you've got to think about when you do a study like that. But uh, the bottom line is we've got our rings back and we image them and you can see these colors represent essentially uh, very lush bacterial uh, colonies establishing themselves on the rings. Again, using a microscopy, we saw this is a bacterial biofilm, it's like a mat that's actually growing on the surface of epithelial cells that develop on the surface of the rings. And um, there were two types of biofilms that we saw, and now the question was, are the these biofilms problematic? Could these lead to infections? Could they lead to actually counteract what we're trying to do, and that's protect women from getting HIV? So we did a study in women, six women who were in herpes positive, HSV positive, 
and we developed the brain for herpes uh, to treat and prevent. And basically, uh, we uh, use the same sequencing tools. We isolated DNA from the rings and from the vaginal tract of the, these uh, participants. And we compared the blue circles, which are the uh, bacterial colonies developing in the rings, with the red circles, which are the ones in the vaginal tract. And as you can see, uh, they're very similar, which means that it doesn't look like there's anything developing on the ring that's any different from the vaginal tract. And if you look at it actually in more detail, you see that that's actually uh, true. Uh, they're very similar. So the rings are actually just an extension of the cell if you want to look at it that way. Last project will be free soon of uh, all my scientific bladder. Um, atmospheric sciences, something completely different, which we do a lot of. We're very interested in seeing what uh, pollutants and motor vehicles emit that nobody's really looked at before. So is this something that is slipping through the cracks that actually is very toxic or very bad for the environment that we're not measuring because it's not regulated by EPA. And uh, we started this study many years ago. We developed an instrument where you had one part of the instrument on one side of the freeway on ramp, actually not that far from here on the 605. And here you had a set of mirrors. And uh, we had two sets of beams of light that would be bouncing back and forth eight times across the street. And then we'd analyze them over here. As cars drive through, we can measure what they're emitting. And we can measure over 20 different compounds, some of which we never measured before. And we discovered, and we were one of the first, that vehicles actually emit a lot of ammonia, which is a basic compound that affects the chemistry of what's happening in the air. So some of the haze that you're seeing on, on hazy days is because of uh, ammonium aerosol, which, as it turns out, is also not very good for your health. So that was a big uh, seminal discovery that we made many years ago. And we went on to uh, do a, two different types of studies. One, which is called a roadway study, where you set up uh, an instrument uh, right by the freeway. So you can sample here. So you're looking at the air right by this uh, 110 freeway. You set up instruments here, and then you set up another set of instruments here in this park where there's no pollution from cars. And the difference between these two sites gives you the pollution contribution from the cars. And so it's a really great system because you can measure thousands of cars in a day. And uh, here's uh, somebody here right by the freeway, as you can see, measuring. And, uh, and then you can look by difference uh, what the cars are emitting. And here's what we did for ammonia. The red is the background side, the blue is the freeway side. And as you can see, the, red, the blue bar is consistently higher than the red bar. And that means that the cars are producing ammonia. And we looked at a whole host of compounds and we're in the middle of still sifting through the data. Finally, uh, we also developed uh, a system that you can put in the back in the trunk of a car. Here it is in the back of a Prius. And it is uh, a whole suite of instruments that we actually developed in-house. It's a laser-based system for looking at hydrogen cyanide. Now you never would have thought that your cars are producing hydrogen cyanide, but they are. Uh, more than 80% of them do. Uh, again, something that we discovered uh, in our research. And we're looking at, we're looking at uh, several hundred different compounds here uh, that are emitted in the car, by the car, as it drives away. So we have this drive cycle in Pasadena, where we do some on-road driving, uh, urban driving, stop and go, and then we have a freeway stretch here. And uh, this is a half an hour drive cycle, and we basically collect information on all the car and what it's emitting over that half an hour. And then we do that on enough cars, uh, we can actually get a feel for uh, the pollution that uh, they're, they're creating. And you can see a, a night drive. So really, uh, all this research that I've just told you about, uh, which is just a snapshot of what we do, uh, was actually done primarily by community college students. So students not that far ahead academically from where you are today. Uh, a lot of this work was also done by high school students. We had uh, several cohorts of high school students, uh, a lot of the DNA extraction that I told about, and uh, the uh, amplification of the DNA in, in, in view of sequencing was all done by high school and community college students. Uh, the field studies by the freeway was done, the first one was done by an extremely bright 19-year-old uh, just out of high school. So when people say that you guys can't do research, that's a little nonsense. You are totally able to do research that is publishable, that competes with what's being done at Caltech and UCLA and all these other places. Uh, there is absolutely nothing that should stop you. Uh, and that's just the theme that you're hearing here today, as you heard from the three previous speakers. And I'm here to tell you it's no different than science. Uh, if you want to do it, and you work hard at it, uh, and you have the opportunity, uh, you, you will be successful and you will be able to, to do something in, in this area. So in closing, I'd like to thank the students, and I would have loved to put their names, but there was about 20 or 30 of them who worked on these different projects. 
uh, collaborators and uh, both at my institution and also elsewhere uh, who make this this, this uh, whole uh, system work. You know, we can all not know everything about everything, so we kind of work on it together. Uh, without the money, uh, none of this would be happening. So I thank uh, all the wonderful institutions who funded it. And Diana for inviting me here today. Thank you very much and uh, the organizing committee for all your work. Thank you.